Um, I'm gonna again record this session for people who are not here um, so that they could have a sense of what happened during this session. Um, so welcome everyone. This is our second session of the day, um, session from 11 to one. So what are we gonna happen during this session and why our outcomes are, is that we want you to get an understanding of the topic for the year. Um, a, um, for the topic for the year that we're going to be debated that of the national topic so a little bit about uh, more into water resources so this session has actually two parts um during this first part uh, we're going to be hearing from jean summers um and the second part we're also going to be going uh diving deeper with roger and ariel uh into the bdl case uh water privatization just lo uh, looking at some strategies of how to teach the case um and during this first part of the session, uh, Jean is gonna kind of like uh, guide us through the uh, a little bit of information. So this is kind of like general topic as well as um, a little bit connected to the topic. So um, we are here for an hour. So Jean is gonna direct this session. So if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to uh, raise your hand or put any questions in the chat. I'm gonna try to monitor the chat and make sure that uh, all your questions are, are answered. Um, and also like kind of like Jean is gonna help you with that. So uh, we just wanna welcome Jean to this session and uh, thank him for his time. Um, so a little bit, I'm not gonna do, spend a lot of time introducing Jean because I wanna also give him the opportunity, but just a little bit um, about Jean. Um, so he is a 30 years uh, veteran of the energy industry. Um, he's a former uh, college, college, college debater. Um, and he's also kind of like done a lot of like speaking at debate um, at debate conference, and he also volunteers at the uh, Urban Debate uh, League. So um, Jean holds a master's in, in industrial engineering uh, from the University of Oklahoma and currently lives in uh, Texas. So he's going to be diving a little bit with us into um, the um, the case, and he's sharing his screen. He's ready to go right now. So just going to in your screen, Jean, so everybody uh, can actually have access uh, to you, can see you. Yeah, just want to make sure everybody can hear me and see the screen. So if we're we're good on both fronts, it looks like we are good in both ends. Okay, seeing me is less important probably, but as long as you can hear me, we're probably good. Um, all right, you want me to kick off? Yes, you are good to go. All right, fantastic. First of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, it's it's really a pleasure to get to talk um, not only about something so close to my heart as debate and the upcoming topic, but water. And and so um, I'll, I'll give an introduction to, to kind of my background, but I've been in water for about the last 10 years. Most of my background before that was in energy. So it's been fascinating to me to kind of see those things come together. And I'm, I'm just excited with the opportunity to talk to you guys. So um, I'm going to kind of split this in two pieces. The first half is really around the broader topic. The second is digging into privatization a little bit. Feel free to stop me as we go. There is a lot of content in here. I'm not going to try to hit all of it or say all the words on the screen. The PDF should be out there for you guys to look at. So I'm going to try to hit most of the high points and then pause for questions. And then hopefully there's some time for discussion. Um, let me just give you a little bit about me so you know where I'm coming from. I went to a really small school no one's heard of, I'm sure, in Oklahoma. It's actually pronounced Miami. I don't know why, versus Miami. Um, my graduating class, there were about 13,000 people in the entire town. So for comparison, Houston Independent School District, where, where I am, has about 200,000 students. I'm sure Boston's similar, but I came from a very small town in Oklahoma. Um, however, Miami did win the first national debate tournament in 1931. So I'm not sure if anyone knew that, but of a trivia fact. So we do have a longstanding debate tradition. I did a lot of different formats back in the mid 80s. Um, hopefully a few of you were alive back then, um, but I know that goes way back. Um, that's my background at the high school level. I debated for the University of Oklahoma. Um, that's me against Air Force a long, long time ago. I think we won that round. So I debated for OU. Um, OU, as you may know, um, has been very successful, particularly on the CETA side of the house. We've got four national championships. I think that's still the most. And my personal claim to fame, which I still remember with my 1AR in this round, was beating SIU, who was ranked number one at the time. So anyway, those are my glory years. Um, I do have some background to debate. I live in Katy, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston. I've got three daughters. Of course, they've never debated. 
I'm the CEO of a company called H2O Midstream. Uh, we're an oil and gas company that manages water. So I've been in and around water, both in the oil patch and outside the oil patch, as I said, for about 10 years now. And I'm on the board of directors, and I also mentor for the Houston Urban Debate League. So that's a bit about my background. Um, I'm sure you guys are talking a lot about this this week, but why water? And just a couple things to share. Um, uh, you know, this, this World Economic Forum every year publishes what they see are the greatest threats to the globe, and it seems to bounce around every year between a couple of, of different ones, but between water crisis and climate change. Uh, but I, I think a lot of people are focused and fixated on air and, and again, global climate change from, from an emissions perspective. But if you step back and think about the crisis happening in water at a global scale, it's, it's at least on that same par. And, and we'll talk a bit about global climate changes we're seeing already associated with water. A few statistics, um, you know, one in 10 people on the planet lack basic drinking water access. And even here in the United States, we'll talk about some of that as well. Two thirds of humanity currently lives in zones that experience water scarcity at least one month a year. And, and I thought this was fascinating that globally less than 1% of wastewater is reused. We just do an incredibly poor job of recycling and reusing water. Um, it is a bipartisan issue in many ways, um, depending on what aisle you sit on. I thought this was interesting, a quote from Donald Trump saying that clean water may be the most important issue we face as a nation for the next generation. So again, I, I, I see this as very much a bipartisan issue. And then one of my favorite quotes, thousands have lived without love, not one without water. So certainly an important topic. Um, water resources. So let's talk a little bit about the specific resolution. And there, there's a couple different definitions that I've kind of played around. But I think it's fascinating if you step back and look at the definition of water resources. And does this imply fresh drinking water? Well, how broad is this topic and what are we really talking about? And I, I've looked at a number of different definitions that definitions that they're pretty similar, that, that it's really the entire range of natural waters that occur on Earth regardless of their state, whether that's vapor, liquid, solid, and I think most importantly, that are of potential use to humans. They don't have to be useful in their current state. So what, what does this mean? I mean, to me, I think the topic is really much broader than just drinking water. And I know we're going to dig in specifically in the case that, that you guys are focusing on, but I think if you step back, it, it also could include discussions on brackish aquifers, produced water that exists alongside oil and gas production, wastewater from human con contamination. And I think if, you know, the Safe Water Drinking Foundation says that pure water itself does not even exist in the natural environment. Water is always found in combination with minerals and chemicals of one kind or another. Sometimes these compounds are present, other times they're present in human activity. So a plan that would deal, in my opinion, again, this is debatable, as is everything, um, you know, deals with things like steam, evaporation, even things like the polar ice caps could be topical under this resolution, uh, because that water is a potential use um, within the, the, the water cycle. So just when you step back and think about that um, to, to frame the discussion. So for me, possible topic areas on the water consumption side, so in other words, using fresh water or using some type of water for consumption, I'll get into statistics in a minute, but everything from thermoelectric power, agriculture, uh, where we're going to kind of dig in is on the public supply municipal drinking water side of the equation, but there's also industrial, oil and gas, hydraulic fracturing is a hot topic in the Houston Urban Debate League that we'll be talking a lot about this year. Um, as well. And there's also dirty contaminated water. So municipal wastewater, industrial pollution and runoff, agriculture, oil and gas produced water. There's a lot of things to talk about, climate change, oceans. So, so it's a broad topic from that perspective. Um, again, as you go into the years, you debate in other leagues, et cetera, I think they're, they're interesting conversations to have. And I think you can also get to some pretty global issues very quickly. When you start talking about energy consumption or you talk about impact on economies, you can, you can get out of sort of regional issues into global issues quickly. So let's kind of start to zero in from very broad in terms of water, but talk a little bit about freshwater supply, which is, which is really where we're going to be focused. Um, so from a freshwater perspective, and I, I don't know how well you can see this, it's kind of a complicated graph, but if you, you start on the left and you look at total global water, the bulk of that water, of course, is in the oceans. It's really only about two and a half percent of total water, water on Earth is considered freshwater. And of that, the bulk of that two and a half percent is actually in glaciers and ice caps. So the remaining water that's available to us is either groundwater or surface water. 
And that's going to be an important issue as well in terms of water quality. If it's a, an aquifer or groundwater, that means it's currently under the ground. It's not, um, while, while rain will fall into lakes and rivers and then get into underground aquifers, it's, it's usually more of a static state um, and drains over time. And then surface or freshwater is what you think about lakes, rivers, streams, et cetera. Both factor into the, the, the water equation. Um, so if you look at the surface freshwater part of that, um, again, you're going to have lakes, you're going to have rivers, et cetera. So that's kind of what the breakdown looks like. And then in terms of who uses fresh water, I thought this was interesting when I started doing this research. The bulk of water consumption is actually for thermoelectric power. And I'm going I'm to talk a little bit about each of these just briefly. Um, irrigation is number two. Um, then you get into public supply, which is the focus of, of the case you guys are working on, um, industrial and then actually under the mining 2%, that's where oil and gas and hydraulic fracturing sits is a subset of the 2% in terms of consumption. So um, again, less than 1% of the Earth's accessible water is considered fresh water. Only 12% is used for public drinking water. And then again, power generation agriculture is, is almost 80% of the total supply. Um, so if you step back from a big picture perspective and you realize in terms of, of protection of water resources itself, and the availability of that water resource, it's a small piece, but in terms of the impact on human life, it obviously is, is critically important, but just wanted to frame that. Um, just a quick primer on each of the biggies. I won't spend a lot of time here, certainly, and if you guys have questions, feel free to jump in. Um, thermoelectric power is, is cooling. So almost all of this water comes from surface water. Um, you know, it's interesting, 52% of fresh surface water withdrawals and about 96% of saline water. So in other words, typically underwater aquifers that have some salt in them that aren't drinkable without additional treatment, um, that available water almost all goes to thermoelectric power. And you can see in the graph really from the 1950s, um, you, you know, the both the irrigation, thermoelectric power, which is the orange graphs, and then um, other industrial use, kind of how that's changed over time. And the reason that's flattened out over the last 40, 20 to 30 years, I guess, is, is a lot of efficiency within the operations themselves. And I'm going to come back to that efficiency question as it relates to residential consumption in a minute. That's the biggest user. Agriculture. Uh, there's a lot on this slide, but just a couple of things. Um, I thought it was interesting that 70% of the world's fresh water is used to produce food. So the bulk of what we use globally is actually to make food, not to drink. Um, and then the concept of whether we irrigate that or whether we just use natural rainfall is important as well. You can kind of see what the U.S. uses relative to Canada and on average irrigated agriculture. So using freshwater supply is about twice as productive as land globally that's just rain fed where we don't use incremental water. Um, I wanted to touch because I'll come back to this notion in, in much of the West that water is transported via complex system of canals and aqueducts. Um, how we actually move water around for agriculture. Um, and then a lot of that now has become privatized. So I think when you think about privatization of municipal water, um, I'll talk about looking at other water examples and certainly agricultural distribution in California is, is an example to look at. But this is a big part of the water cycle in the US. Industrial use is kind of number three on the list. Um, it's, it's used for processing, washing, cooling, producing chemicals, food, paper products. Um, there, there's a lot of different uses of water within the industrial sector. I kind of picked out three that I thought were interesting. Um, I, I thought semiconductors were fascinating that a single eight inch wafer uses up to 2000 gallons of ultra pure water. So it's gotta be incredibly clean. Pulp and paper is still a huge user. You know, I, it, it was surprising to me the pulp and paper industry is still going strong, uh, but it is, um, you know, and, and so we use a lot, a lot of water in that sector. And then this was fascinating to me is data centers. The evolution of now data centers um, use about three to five million gallons of water a day, which is equivalent to a city of about 30 to 50,000 people. And I'm going to share a statistic later where the bulk of our municipal water serves towns of under 10,000 people. Um, this is not an insignificant number. Um, and I think given the growth in that sector, um, it's, it's really interesting as well that the water consumption is so high. And I'll talk later about efficiency between water and um, other resources. So in this case, electricity, data centers are used to maximize the, the or, or sorry, use as little electricity as possible. And they're able to use water for cooling, which takes a lot of water. So they do that because water's inexpensive. Uh, 
um, typically, um, I would argue artificially inexpensive. We'll come back to that concept, but this, this, this growth in data centers in the industrial sector is pretty material. Uh, the fourth, uh, which is, and I'm kind of skipping over municipal because we're going to dig dive, we're going to dive kind of deep in that, but is oil and gas shell development. This is where I spend the bulk of my time. Um, and, and, you know, arguably hydraulic fracturing or fracking is, is argued, this is Forbes said this in 2018, the most important energy discovery in the last half century. You know, it's really changed the balance of power um, and, and moved the U.S. from a net oil importer for decades to a, next oil, a net oil exporter. Um, arguably lowered energy prices, strengthened security. There, there's a lot of arguments in favor. Um, the flip side from a water perspective are the challenges to hydraulic fracturing. Um, you know, some of the, the, the concerns around contamination, um, you know, safety, earthquakes and seismicity, that there's a lot of challenges to the practice. And again, I think this is, this is an interesting topic debate through, the, through the, the lens of, of water relative to what the global impacts on energy are um, as well. So, um, you know, that, that whole water energy nexus is, is an interesting one, at least in the world that I live. Um, the other kind of side of the coin is wastewater contamination. So in addition to thinking about fresh, fresh water, what is the impact on water supply? And, and this is just a real simple picture. I'm not going to go real deep into this, um, but there's a lot of depth here. But, you know, pesticides, fertilizers, chemical spills, landfills, um, you know, air pollution. Um, I will touch a little bit on municipal. There are a lot of ways in which contaminated, you know, water is contaminated and the whole notion of how we deal with that contamination, how we protect that resource. Again, thinking about contaminated water is in fact a resource. Um, it's, it's not a waste, a waste by the definition of, of the, the topic. So how do we protect that water? How do we ensure that, that, you know, contaminants don't get in the water in the first place? And then how do we deal with them once they are? Whether that goes back into the drinking water supply or not, um, really is not the issue. It's still part of that water cycle. So I did want to touch just a bit on the municipal wastewater infrastructure. We'll dig into the freshwater supply. Um, but, but, you know, arguably this is one of the most significant, um, you know, developments in, in, in our lifetime what was wastewater, the management of wastewater and the infrastructure that goes behind it. You know, 75% of our population is served by centralized wastewater, 16,000 different treatment facilities, um, treat about 32 billion gallons of water every day. Um, the EPA is called overflows from combined sewer systems. The largest category of our nation's wastewater infrastructure still needs to be addressed. Um, so just improperly sized wastewater systems as we've grown. And then, you know, the conversations around, um, you know, the cost that it's going to take um, and the EPA estimating about $270 billion over the next 20 years to really upgrade that infrastructure. So, um, you know, if I if I pause there and just think about for a minute, um, you know, the the uh, the kind of the broad elements of the topic th those cover a lot of the different areas, and then I want to kind of touch one last thing before we go into the freshwater side is is really just climate change effect on water, and I and I thought this was fascinating. If if you look at sort of pre climate change impacts and post climate change impacts, and and what that's doing to our water supply, and and in some cases what it means is in areas that don't have sufficient water in the West, um, climate change is causing those to become drier and more drought ridden and more difficult to get water. In other areas where there's an abundance of precipitation, we're experiencing flooding where we've never experienced flooding before. So this whole idea, and, and, and you know, for me that I, I live in the oil and gas space and there's a lot of talk about emissions and flare reduction emissions, critically important, but in many cases, the impacts of those emissions um, aren't going to be seen for quite some time. We're already seeing the impacts on changes in water patterns. So from my perspective, focusing on water now and the impacts of water now and how we deal with that is an immediate challenge we have to deal with from climate change um, that, that I think is, is um, very important. So I think it's just important as we go into this topic to recognize the linkages between both climate change, what that means in terms of our supply, what that means in terms of, of changes across the country and the water cycle and, and ultimately how those things connect. So I'm gonna pause there. Um, that was sort of just a brief overview of everything but kind of the core freshwater municipal privatization topic. I was gonna switch gears, kind of give a few thoughts there um, I'm probably not the definitive expert in that space, but kind of given the knowledge and the background I've got, I wanted to at least share a few things there. But before we dive into what I'll call municipal water supply, are there any questions kind of on the broader topic 
based on what I presented so far. Does that make sense so far? Too quick, too slow? I'm trying to keep it under 300 words a minute, which I don't, I don't have that pace anymore. That was a joke for the policy debaters in the room. So somebody smile at that. that yeah, okay. All right, keep going. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the municipal side. So if you kind of circle back to that graph I showed earlier, talked about the 12%, this is really what we're talking about is getting water to people like you and I, communities, individuals, um, so that we have fresh drinking water um, every single day. So I'm gonna start with the regulatory framework um, first because I think this is important in understanding this topic. Um, so kind of a brief history of government water laws, and I am not an expert on the government, but really going back to the 1800s, the River and Harbor Acts, looking at pollution in our, in our waterways, um, 1912, the U.S. Public Health Service Act, really trying to prevent waterborne illness in the 40s and 50s, the Federal Water Pollution Act, in 1972 is the Clean Water Act. This is really what regulates discharge from wastewater facilities. So when you get into that side of the topic, the Clean Water Act is really the key piece of legislation that you're going to get into. But in terms of fresh water or clean water, a lot of it centers on the Safe Water Drinking Act. And that implemented in 1974. And the precipitous for, for both the, the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act, a, a 1969 report found that 40% of all public water systems weren't doing enough to keep their water safe. And between 1960 and 1970, there were 46,000 instances of waterborne disease in the U.S. So it was really a crisis in kind of the late 60s, early 70s, which really drove this legislation and ultimately the Safe Water Drinking Act, which is the foundation for, for what we're going to talk about. Uh, it was drafted in 1974. It's been amended twice. The two amendments really had to do with the way contaminants were um, included in the list um, of, of things that needed to be regulated, as well as the stringency in which they could regulate. It sets a national health-based standard for drinking water to protect against naturally occurring and man-made contaminants. The EPA is responsible um, for setting the standards based on science. They have economic tests they have to do. Um, so they do have to look at the technology and costs necessary to remove contaminants. Um, there, there are different categories. Um, I guess I'll come on to this in a minute. So digging in a little bit further, um, it gave the EPA full authority to set national health standards for drinking water. The EPA delegated the responsibility to enforcing those standards to the state. So it's important to realize it's a federal regulation out of the EPA, but they have delegated that to the state. So it's the states that are responsible for making sure it's enforced. Um, however, if they fail to enforce, the EPA can always step in um, and enforce them. And really what you're talking about is, is regulation, and, and I'll talk about contaminants in a minute, but it only extends to public water systems that serve 20, at, at least 25 people. There's actually three categories. There's less than 25, with, which are completely unregulated. There's a middle category, which is sort of 25 people on a temporary basis. So gas stations, for example, that have transient populations, they have some different regulations. And then the bulk is, is people that, that are in cities and towns like you and I. But there are about 36 million Americans um, with well water they must monitor on their own. So they don't have to comply. Um, so really what the Safe Drinking Water Act did is it established contaminants and ultimately you had to test for those contaminants and the, the, the utility that delivered those to you and I had to ensure they were a particular level. So really the, the, the number of contaminants were established by 2006, really almost all by 1998. And you can kind of see the history here. So there haven't been a lot of new contaminants added, but what has changed, arsenic's a good example, um, the, the EPA has changed the amount that can be in the water. And what that's really done is for municipalities or um, utilities that are serving you and I, it's ultimately their job to ensure those contaminants are removed, depending where they are, depending on changes and the cost of technology. That can be either very easy or very difficult. And so as the regula re regulations have evolved and, and they've become more stringent in some cases, it's been more difficult for the utilities to meet those standards and requirements at the same cost levels. Again, arsenic being a great example, when the EPA changed that, um, it was really significant for a lot of the smaller utilities and it was material, material cost. So that Safe Drinking Water Act just establishes, again, the, the mission, the importance of what the utilities do is to comply with this particular regulation. So that, that sets the standard as to what needs to be done. 
So switching from kind of the end game to the actual um, physical infrastructure necessary to do that. So this is a very simple drawing, um, water supply distribution system. And, and what's really important is, is you kind of, it, there's several, you can think about this almost as a value chain or distribution chain. That, that source water box on the bottom left, that's where a lot of tension is, is focused. Where does the water come from? Is that an aquifer? Is it a lake? Is it a river? It could actually be the discharge from a municipal wastewater facility. It, it could be anything. It could be a varying quality. It could be almost very pure from a spring. It could highly contaminate it. But the source is kind of the first part of the equation. The second is the treatment facility. And again, depending on the quality of that water, that could be a very light treatment and could be very inexpensive. Or in some parts of the country, it could be materially expensive and the ability to maintain that effectively will affect the quality downstream. Um, storage is next. Um, we don't consume water rateably. We consume different amounts at different times of the day. Um, so having sufficient storage to meet those peak demands is important. Um, it's probably less important than in other industries. So I work in the gas and, and the electricity industry where you see peak demands in the afternoon. For example, you have to have material storage or peaking capacity to come online. Um, it's not quite as extreme in the water system, but when you get out of the residential side into industrial and other oil and gas consumption, storage is a much bigger part of the equation. And then there's all the distribution pipe to get it to homes and businesses as well. So it's a complex system. Um, ultimately, water utilities have the responsibility to make that water, untreated water, drinkable and usable. Um, again, it's from a number of different sources. They need to meet the EPA health standards. And then you've got broad sort of distribution requirements. So the way that I think about this is water logistics. So I kind of touched on this, but maybe just to hit the point home, that treatment is always necessary. The question isn't whether it's necessary. The question isn't, does the technology exist? It's always, what does it cost? That's really the question. Transportation, um, you know, often, I guess, especially globally, the source is not near the demand center where the homes and businesses are. So cost of that infrastructure to transport um, is another part of economic feasibility, storage we touched on, and economics ultimately drive federal, state, local governments um, determining which technologies, policy, and programs succeed. And an example for me, just a very simple one, is an ocean water example. There's obviously more than enough water from oceans to address the entire world supply problem. Um, however, the combined cost of treatment transportation makes it economically unfeasible. So I think just thinking about it through that framework is important that it comes back to economics. So just a couple facts, some facts on municipal water infrastructure. Um, you know, there are more than 50,000 drinking water systems like I just described um, in the US today, 39 billion gallons of drinking water, 2.2 millions of pipe. Most of that was put in about 50 years ago. Um, as an engineer, I can tell you that not many things last for 50 years. We typically design for 20 to 25 year life. Um, so we're dealing with that today. Uh, between 2012 and 2018, the rate of water main breaks increased by 27%. Um, you know, that was $7.6 billion of treated water that we lost due to leaks. Um, so it is a major issue. I know this graph is really hard to see. Um, the reason I included this, and there are a number of different estimates, but this is done by the American Society of Civil Engineers, which is about the most unbiased source I could find. And it is telling you that our spending gap is about $81 billion um, that will grow to about 136 billion. So between 2019 and 20, 2039, they see an investment gap of about $2.2 trillion in order to rebuild this infrastructure. Um, so, you know, in terms of what the impact would be on the gross domestic product, you know, how many jobs would be created, I won't dig into all this. This is kind of gold for debaters on the subject, you know, all the statistics. But there's lots of costs associated and necessary with building this out. So suffice it to say, funding of these systems is, is, is a nexus issue. Um, and then much of this gap is attributed to low priority assigned to water systems in the past municipal budgets. Um, you know, some of these are, are because of demographics, urban populations. Um, but the, the bottom line is we have capital we need to spend to rebuild our infrastructure. It's just the, the fact of where we are today as a nation. Um, I thought this was interesting. Um, and I'm not real familiar with the NRDC. I think it's worth kind of finding out who funds them and, and who they're behind. But I thought it was fascinating that about a third of our community drinking water systems actually violated the Safe Drinking Water Act. Now, these could be minor violations, but um, it's fascinating to me that, that this is the degree of the problem. And 77 million people got their water from those, um, those systems. 
And then in 2015 alone, there were 80,000 reported violations of the Safe Drinking Water Act by community water systems. Again, those are the standards associated or established by the federal government to keep us safe um, and our drinking water safe. So um, I'm going to switch gear a little bit and go into the ownership of water utilities, which again, I think is the, the core of what your, your case, kind of what you want to debate. Um, again, just feel free to raise your question, raise your hand with questions if you want me to pause. As again, we're going from very broad to very narrow. So, so I'm now kind of digging into the actual ownership question of the water utilities themselves and what those implications are. Okay. So just at a very simple level, uh, again, this is probably everybody knows this, but public publicly owned water utilities or assets. They're owned and operated by the local government, municipality, or public entity. They're funded via tax revenue or other forms of government funding, and they're either elected or appointed officials. Private assets known um, by private sector firm, you know, known as investor-owned water utilities. It's interesting to designate they could be privately owned by a private company or owned based on, they publicly owned in the sense of they're, they're, they're traded on the stock exchange. So you and I could buy stock in them. So technically they're publicly owned, but they're not publicly in terms of the local area. So a distinction, again, just to be clear, um, we consider them private or privatization, although they could be publicly traded stocks, for example, investor owned utilities. It's also important to note that they're regulated. So in some cases like electricity is a great example, where states like Texas and California have utilities that are now unregulated. So we can buy electricity from anybody, for example, competition um, will drop, will keep price low, but I could, I could buy my electricity from 50 different providers. Here, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a, a, uh, an entity which may be privately owned, but is still regulated, um, both in terms of the standards they have to meet, as well as the rates they can charge. So um, it's a regulated privately owned utility as opposed to a municipal owned or publicly owned utility. So some distinction there. So public versus private ownership. So just some statistics. Um, today about uh, you know, close to 90% of the total population is served by public systems as opposed to private. Um, however, it's fascinating to me that when you look at the number of systems, the numbers are actually much closer. And if you look at it on a statewide basis, again, I don't know how well you can see that, but in some cases it's as close as 40 to almost 50% of the systems. And the reason for that is there are a lot of smaller systems, but when you look at the large urban centers that com comprise a lot of the population, um, those are actually, again, on, on, a, on a numbers, most of that is public, but from a number of systems, many, many more are private. Um, which I found interesting. And then also this was something I, I didn't fully recognize is that all, all water systems in the US were initially privately owned and operated. At the beginning of the 19th century, all but one were private. By the end of the 19th century, most of those have switched and um, to municipal ownership. And in, by, by, the by 1896, only about nine of the largest 50 cities were relied upon privately owned waterworks. We'll talk about international view in a minute, but we have come from being privately owned to public has kind of been the long-term trend. So I wanted to pose really three nexus questions when you think about public versus private, um, at least in my mind, things to consider. I think the first question is who can best ensure the health and safety of the, safety of the people served? This is all about meeting the clean, water, the clean water standards established by the EPA. Who can best do that? Who can do it at the lowest cost? And then what is the comp cost impact on the consumer? Um, and I think this last one is a really important question and, um, and, I'll, and I'll show some data in a minute where I, I think that publics inherently are able to provide this service cheaper, not cheaper, but, but offered a lower price, although that lower price may be artificially subsidized. And the challenge that may or may not be a good thing. And the example I will give you as in the energy sector, um, one of the drivers of um, renewable energy development or alternative energy development has been higher energy prices driving that adoption. You look at Germany, Spain, European countries that have shifted to renewables, it's been the high cost of fossil fuels, whether that's been because the, the, the cost imposed to clean those fossil fuels up. But, but when you have inexpensive gas or inexpensive coal and energy prices are cheap, the impetus to switch to renewables um, are, not as, are not as high. Similarly in water, where you have water priced very inexpensively for consumers, that also does not necessarily drive efficiency or use of that water. So there's, a, I think, a very important debate about on one hand, 
the idea that low cost water so that it's accessible to everybody regardless of social status or financial income is important but on the other hand pricing it inefficiently drives behavior which actually wastes more water um, as well and i think there are analogs in the energy sector and others for that conversation so i, I think that's a, a robust debate um, so the case for privatization you guys are going to go into this in a lot more detail than i am so i'm just going to hit a couple high points um, i think clearly what happened in flint michigan is, is a, a is a catalyst is there a question yes Jean, there is a yeah. question in the chat uh yes uh, chris uh, uh so there is the question if is the trend of water resource ownership from private to public and ent entities about bipartisan one yeah that's a that's a great question um when we say bipartisan, I think it's going to be a question of local and state politics relative to, I mean, local versus state versus federal. Um, what, what I saw in the, in the research I did is it had flattened out, and I think there's um, a lot of very local issues which are driving it to stay where municipalities actually control. I think at the federal level, you're probably seeing more push for the federal government to intervene to address the infrastructure questions. And then um, how do you best do that? So I think there are federal level incentives that are pushing toward privatization, because I think you, you, you can set up a regulatory framework at the federal level that allows utilities, privatized utilities to participate and be regulated under a federal regime, whereas I think the local and state, there's still a lot of local pressure to keep those in the hands of local folks. So I think it's a complex issue when you talk about bipartisan support. But I, but I think it's it's probably a pretty flat from the research I've done. It's not it's not trending one way or the other. I don't know if that answers the question or not. There is one more question in the chat, uh, Kosha. So I, I'm trying to read the questions, uh, but if you at some point have questions, feel free to also unmute yourself um, as well. Uh, it's, it's a little bit hard when you're presenting to see the um, the questions on the chat for Jing. Uh, but the next question, Jing, is uh, what about communities that are so small uh, that the municipalities or towns cannot keep up with infrastructure? Uh, is the federal money for that? Yep, I'm going to come onto that in just a minute. Yeah, that's that. That actually is a good lead in. That I, that I think that's one of the biggest drivers for privatization is the smaller utilities, the smaller communities. And, and um, there's actually a couple different ways to address that. There, there's a privatization. I'm going to talk about public-private partnerships and even regionalization. So there's different ways in order to address that. But I, but I think that is one of the biggest drivers are smaller communities and their ability to access funding um, and, and I think that's a big challenge. And, and again, linking it back to the, the freshwater drinking standards, as those have gotten more and more stringent, it's been more difficult for those small communities to make sure they're hitting that spec and also for them to have the funding to replace aging infrastructure. So it's put a real burden on those smaller communities. But I'll, I'll touch on that a bit more. Um, so you guys are probably familiar with Flint, Michigan. Again, often it's, it's, it's the catalyst that's in the press that drives a lot of public sentiment. And, and this is one clearly that'll get a lot of talk this year. Um, and this is kind of, I, I thought this was fascinating. I did not know this, that about 95% on, on, you know, in terms of the total number serve less than 10,000 people, right? So you're talking about some very, very large cities with very, very large publicly owned water utilities. Um, but you're also talking about many, many small ones. And those private entities um, often are better positioned from an economy of scale and bringing best practices from industry, scientific knowledge into those sort of problem solving um, uh, situation. This was also interesting. There's a number of different studies out there that have shown that um, private utilities have actually done a better job at compliance with EPA regulations, which is maybe not what you would think intuitively, but there are a number of studies which have shown this. There's also some data I'll show you on the international front, which has shown this. So I think that's part of the case for privatization is there's data that says they've been more effective at actually complying with federal regulation, um, which again, the counter is gonna be, hey, you're a private company, you don't care, but that's not what the data shows. Um, again, the idea that the private sector in general increases competition, decreases costs, improves efficiency, um, and then access to needed capital. There's also some pretty interesting discussion around foreign companies, um, Veolia, 
um, for example, um, and other large foreign companies that are looking to invest in the US, this is very similar to what happened in renewable energy where you had Suez and other large utilities step in with large investments in the US um, to make renewable investments. So um, again, some, some of the, the, the benefits of privatization, challenges, um, again, I think this is going to be a common one focused on short-term profit versus long-term needs. Are local communities better positioned to really, uh, you know, know what those needs are? There, there's also a big question about um, if you privatize and it goes wrong, can you reverse or not and go the other way? Um, the idea of abuse of monopoly power, again, we're not really talking about a competitive environment where you have 10 different private companies offering different services. You're talking about a single investor owned utility that's regulated um, that, that then has monopoly power. And you're now taking out of the hands of the local community, the regulation, and you're putting them in the hands of the state. So it's the public utility commission at the state level, which is now regulating the rates, now regulating the way they operate. Essentially what the, what the utility is doing is they're making a case to the state they're investing dollars, they're going to the state and saying, here's what we've invested, we want rate recovery, we want a rate of return. Um, how capable are those, um, you know, those entities of monitoring and ensuring that's done in a way that benefits the local communities? Uh, there, there's also tax treatment means higher water rates. I kind of touched on this earlier, um, that there's a bias against private operations in the tax code, that a private operator, um, in terms of the way they deal with depreciation, um, and profits, they've got to report it a certain way. Public sector may be able to get subsidies or other political concessions that privates can't. So ultimately, it will likely mean a lower cost to the consumer. And again, depending on which side of the debate you're on, that's either a good thing because um, you know people are able to get access to water. On the flip side, you can drive inefficiencies and sort of extend a cycle. So I think those are in my mind, some of the challenges. And then I think you could also make an argument that pressure from privatization has already raised the standard for publics. You're already starting to see public municipality, municipalities implement private best practices. So the problem's not as bad as it might otherwise have been in the past. So I think there's certainly both sides of the debate. You guys will go a lot deeper in this as you uncover the topic, but as I did the research, these were things that just kind of stood out at me. Um, and there were two alternatives I thought were interesting. So the notion of a public-private partnership. So if you step back for a second, there's an alternative where the municipality or the public entity retains ownership and control of the asset, but they just outsource the contract. So instead of having a, a private entity own and operate the asset and be regulated at the state, you essentially just have a, a contract for operation. So again, the public owns it. They just write a contract. Someone comes in that's a private entity. They just do the operations. Um, everything else stays the same. So the revenues that the private partner gets are not tied to the rate charge. They're just a, a contract price that are paid just like any other cost. Um, and they're not regulated at the state level. So it's an interesting way that allows you to form a partnership, avoids the some of the downfalls of privatization, um, making it a full investor owned utility. Um, it also allows, I think this was interesting, cancellation of private involvement is easier. Um, the public entity never relinquishes ownership of the assets. The private operates under a contract that allows the public entity to take operations at any time for any reason. So you can unwind that pretty easily. Um, there are about 2,000 facilities in the U.S. that operate in public-private partnerships. I thought this was fascinating. Data from Public Works Financing shows that 5391 private water contracts came up for renewable, for renewal, and 97% were renewed within the industry. And there's a lot of data that when these public-private partnerships come in place, they're almost never canceled, that, that it's very rare that they're not renewed. And, and the argument here is that they're effective, they work well as an alternative. So I think this could be an interesting, whether this is a, um, a case twist, whether this is a counter plan, um, however you might implement it, I, I think it's interesting that there's it's an alternative. Um, those public-private partnerships have doubled from 1997 to 2001 and have been fairly static sent, since. And there's some things in the federal tax law that I touched on that provide advantages under these kind of partnerships that don't provide the same advantage under privately owned systems. So I think this is an interesting alternative to consider. Uh, regionalization is another approach. This is the idea where smaller communities band together 
Um, so they regionalize. So rather than being a single community managing, you know, 5,000 people, they create a larger, and there's a number of different examples of this around the country where they've consolidated and that allows them to achieve scale, performance improvements, similar to what privately owned investor utilities can do. Uh, the primary barriers have been institutional politicals as policymaking. Policymakers may not favor consolidation um, because now you're talking about having to get along with your neighbors and come up with sort of common approaches. Um, and so that's been a challenge to regionalization. Um, and again, I think this is an alternative, both the privatization or private public partnership. So I didn't dig into this real far, but I thought it was an interesting concept. Um, again, that could be laid out as a counter plan or, um, you know, however you'd want to use it um, to think about. So a couple of more slides to touch on. Um, I thought it was interesting to look at what's happened outside of the U.S. Yep, I'll pause. Hey, hey Jean, uh, just there's a couple of questions here. Yes. Uh, one yeah. from Chris about uh, if you know why private companies may be in better compliance. Um, if it is because there are, are the state utilities regulated more aggressive with private company, companies or is this something specific to the industry? Yeah, I, I think there's probably two reasons. I think number one, um, they're held accountable at the State Public Utility Commission. So there's an external agency that is ensuring they're complying. So if you're an investor owned utility, um, you have to submit reports and um, you know standards to an outside agency that's gonna watch over you, number one. And if you fail to comply, you're gonna get hit with fines and you're gonna have all kinds of consequences. Number two, you're set up in such a way that you're utilizing best practices from the industry. Um, you may manage water systems across the country. And so you're in a position to have the funding, the capability, the science, the technology, the expertise to do things really well. On the other hand, if you're a small community, number one, you're sort of self-regulating. So to some extent, what's, what's the saying? The fox is managing the hen house. So you're not, you're not compliant. You still have to meet an EPA regulation ultimately, but, but the, right, the, the way in which you do that is in-house, number one. That can be subject to local politics, politics corruption, um, all kinds of things which can drive it. And you also may be a small entity, so you're not as well equipped to ensure you're doing it right. So you just may not have the technology, the resources, you're not putting as much money into testing and monitoring and distribution. So you're just not as well equipped to ensure that you're successfully meeting the standard. So I would say, and this is supposition on my part, that those would be probably the arguments that I would make as to the reason why the data is bearing out. Investor owned utilities are more effectively able to meet the health standard. That'd be my argument. Does that make sense? Okay, so yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, I, I made yes, guess. thank you, sorry. Okay. Okay. I, there is one more question. Sorry, go ahead, yeah. Chris. Oh, no, I, I just, I followed, thank you. And, and there's probably a counterpoint there as well, but that's, that's kind of my interpretation of the data. Okay. Um, just touch a little bit, and again, I think it's it's interesting, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about research analogs, but to look at what's happened internationally, um, just some interesting data points. France has been almost private since creation. Um, you know, the first was in 1782. Mexico, um, late 1800s. England actually was private, um, and then after 86 years, uh, then they switched from private to public, um, switched back to private again. Um, and then if you look at OECD countries, about up to 25% of the population, and this is probably not real easy to see, but you can see around the world, and these are just OECD countries um, that, are, that are colored, you know, in some cases in Europe, over 70% are privatized, and then it's kind of all across the board. So you, you can see um, globally, there's some analogs to look at. And again, I don't know how well you can see the data here on your screen. Um, but, you know, some, some work that's been done showing that privates are, um, you know, doing a better job than publics um, in some case studies. So there, there's different data out there on the international sector. So again, kind of from a research perspective, something to think about. So I, so I, I got to thinking about this again from a research analog, ways I would probably approach this. One would be to look at other sectors. So solid waste collection. How is public versus privatization in you know, your trash collection? You know, companies like um, waste management, for example, which which are very profitable, very successful, 
um, investor owned utility analog, if you will, for trash collection, waste connections. They've aggregated over the last 10 to 15 years, very small municipal facilities, bought them out, rolled them up into a public company um, and, and built a kind of a waste empire around that. So I think there's some interesting analogs. Has that been good or bad um, for consumers and, and for the, the public at large? Natural gas, I live kind of in the natural gas world. Um, we deregulated in 1978. Um, at, at the wellhead, but you still have gas distribution and collection systems that are run by regulated public utilities. Same thing for electricity. Um, but I think looking at other sectors, have those been successful models or not? I think it's interesting. And then other water, uh, municipal wastewater, I think is interesting. What's happened on the wastewater side of the equation? California irrigation systems that I mentioned, oil and gas sector. I mean, all of that is um, done by, by public companies. I'm sorry, private companies, industrial use. I think just from a research perspective, um, there are other ways to look at the topic and draw analogs from it. So I have one thing. Um, I, 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 this is my next to last slide. Um, I don't know if you guys do critiques in the Boston Debate League. When I debated, they did not exist. There's no, there was no such thing as critiques. I was still learning what they were. Um, but I just had a thought here, and you guys may be thinking about. But, but for me, arguably one of the most important factors that differentiate first versus third world countries and define the quality of life as access to clean water. Um, so it raises the question. I, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, I run a business, I think of everything through an economic lens, quite frankly. But if you step back, is water, do you treat it that way? I mean, most of what I just presented to you is from an economic perspective, right? How do you think about the economics of this? Um, thinking about it as a resource or a commodity. Um, but what if it's a, a human right as opposed to a resource? What if you thought about it through that lens? Um, is there a critique that basically says the underlying assumptions in the, in the resolution are wrong, and before you even consider the policy implications, it, it needs to be considered a human right, and even the way that I've talked about it or we talk about it is, is making an underlying assumption that should be rejected. Um, you know, and I think um, arguably things like energy, and if you can argue that the, you know, the flip side would be improperly pricing water that drives up costs or uses more energy, for example, and in my world, hydraulic fracturing would be example, um, you know, that's, that's also impacting human rights. You can't look at water in isolation. And then ultimately, you know, by framing it as a right, as opposed to a commodity, does it shift it from policy to philosophy? This is not my area of expertise. I just thought it was something interesting to contemplate. Again, that, that kind of nexus question, are we talking about a resource? Or are we talking about a right? So, um, that's kind of all I prepared. I had kind of one last quote that I thought was interesting. Um, the crisis of our diminishing water resources is just as severe, if less obviously immediately, as any wartime crisis we have ever faced. Our survival is just as much at stake as it was at the time of Pearl Harbor or the Aragon or Gettysburg or Saratoga. So um, just going to pause there. And if there are other questions, discussion, hopefully that was helpful in, in terms of um, just teeing up some thoughts. And I can probably stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. I'll stop that. All right, and we're back. Okay. So I will pause for questions or discussion. Is anyone awake? Let me start with that. I'm just curious. There was a UN report, I believe, from 2018, if I remember right. I mean, Alabama, where you have, um, I think, Bullock County, Butler, you know, Green. Well, you know, I guess kind of compare, I guess, since you used first word, which is kind of weird, but um, how does that compare, like places like, you know, Alabama, where the water conditions, I guess you can say, is very much, you know, comparatively aligned with like a third world countries? Like how, I mean, how does that system work? I mean, I have, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, there's probably, and I'm not familiar specifically, but, but my hunch is probably, um, again, if you go back to that very simple diagram of the source water, the storage, the distribution, um, it's, it's pretty much that's going to be the same in every location, right? You're going to have some source, whether that's an underground aquifer, whether it's a river, whether it's a lake. Um, in some cases, and, and globally, you'll find this, there's just not very good access to the source. It's just very difficult 
whether that's a well water, whether that, you know, whatever. I think what you're finding in some of the poorer communities are a lack of investment in the physical infrastructure. So they're, they're just not, you know, so for example, let's say you have a, a, a treatment plant that's 50 years old and the treatment plant is removing arsenic. And in order to make it do that on a sustainable basis, we have to replace three units. That's going to be $10 million. That's going to require a referendum. That's going to raise taxes. Um, and, and so I think you're much more willing to live on the edge of poor quality water because you have other competing resources, whether that's, you know, whatever, whatever that is, we just don't have the resource to put into fixing the things we need to do or make them reliable. So they fail, people are, are not monitoring it. And so when you actually test the quality of the water, you realize you're not make, meeting on a consistent basis because there's a cost associated with doing it. So my hunch is, my supposition is, in poor communities like that, um, they're not getting the attention, they're not getting the resources to maintain those basic levels of public health. And I think that's part of the argument. But others Thank may have different views, yeah. I will encourage you to unmute yourself to ask the questions. That may be easier for Jean to uh, hear your questions rather than uh, and if you have comments, also questions, send it to the chat. We, we keep uh, track of it. And I can see the chat now. I, when I stopped sharing, now I, can, I couldn't see how I was sharing, but now I can kind of see. I think you have a question from uh, Curtis. Yes. Um, yeah, I, can, I can ask it out loud. It's in the chat as well. But um, given that so much of the presentation around like water utilities focused on decisions that were happening on the municipal and state level, um, what are some things that the US federal government could do to influence that uh, discussion? Yeah, I, th I think a lot of it's gonna be funding. A lot of it's gonna be making funding available, I think. Um, the other could be providing specific incentives. Um, you know, to, to if you meet this, then you get a certain concession, whether it's a tax break, whether it's a subsidy. I think a lot is gonna, gonna center around funding. I, I think a more extreme perspective might be to actually adjust some of the laws. So to go into the Clean Water Act and could you make an argument that some of the requirements are too onerous, that, you know, the arsenic spec is, is not, you know, is not a big a deal, for example. I mean, I think, or make it more stringent in some cases. Um, make penalties, put people in jail if they fail to comply. So I think a lot of it is going to be the influence the federal government has to set the standard of water quality, the access to funding, and the incentive mechanisms they have to drive particular behavior, I, I think would be my perspective on it. And um, I'll, I'll just add in, Curtis, um, we're going to have a more detailed plan for the high school JV slash middle school varsity packet, which does give a more direct rather than just saying, like, should invest in or support. Um, it'll give a mechanism. The two ones we're considering right now are following uh, California's model. Um, and you can look that up if you'd like. Uh, but the other one is um, there is a, a bill in the Senate sponsored by Tammy Duckworth um, last year that basically said um, we are going to provide subsidies to ensure that when we switch to a private water company, the cost of the consumer does not go up for at least three years. So that's like one mechanism the federal government could give as a subsidy to ease the transition. And, and I do, I did just to touch on that, I think it's fascinating this notion of whether we want the price to go up or not to the consumer. Um, because I think your, your immediate reaction is we want to keep it low, we're, we're concerned about people being able to afford it, but I think especially when you start looking at industrial use and, um, you know, commercial use, the, the impacts arguably that, that underpriced water has had, and, you know, we're trading water in California now um, to try and address some of the agricultural issues of underpricing water, so I think that's an interesting question too, um, you know, depending on what sector you're, of the population you're in. question. I'm just curious. Uh, I think about our resolution with respect to um, kind of us kind of compressing the issue to just this kind of domestic arena, but similar to climate change, which seems inextricably linked to this whole water crisis, have there been any kind of like national attempts or international attempts, I mean, to kind of tackle this? So I'm thinking now of the Paris Climate Agreement and have conversations begin, begun at the UN level or at, at any level about how to tackle this as a human race. 
there have been some. It's it's interesting. Um, there's there's a guy I can I can probably link. James Reese does some writing on this. That that his his big complaint is everyone is folk not everyone but a lot of the world is focused on um, it's emissions right air emissions. So so in terms of thinking about global and emissions and, and CO two and and that has been um, really the focus. Whereas there are a lot of water issues that are global that are not getting the same attention and yet. The crisis is just as high, so it hasn't had the same sort of mobile international mobilization as it has air emissions. It's been more regional, more local. That there are certainly attempts, organizations that that are doing that, but I would say, at least from my perspective, it, it's not as um, it, it's not as organized or as cohesive as it is on on the water side as it is on the air side. If that makes sense, but there there's certainly organizations attempting to do that. But, it, but in many cases, it's such a regional local issue that, that they're specific kind of political drivers. And uh, Jim, I just wanna make sure you get to um, Jenny and uh, Alyssa's questions in the chat here. I think they're uh, both also uh, pre pretty interesting in terms of uh, the perspective. Yeah, this, this came up in, in the Houston, we had kind of done a similar topic in Houston discussion. And um, I, I think it's a great question. You start talking about what the question here is water is a right perspective of water is culture or culture and spiritually connected to ancestral lands, indigenous lands. And um, let me go look at the other question. Cultural, historical, spiritual significance of water for some communities is intertwined. I, I think those are great, great points, especially again, you get into indigenous peoples. Um, you get into sort of some critique questions there, um, you, you know, all kinds of interesting places to take that around cultural, historical, spiritual significance. It's not something that I've done a lot of research on. You know, I, I kind of live in the business world and so tend to think through an economics lens. But I, I think that's a fantastic point of view and really to reframe the debate completely um, from just about economics. And, and I think even that underlying assumption is, is, is ripe for a, a critique time type of discussion on, you know, we're, we're kind of missing the point before we can even have that conversation. We need to explore water through a completely different lens and, and how meaningful it is to, to certain people and, and really potentially all of us as a human right. Yeah, I don't have great insights on that, but I'll just say, I think it's, it's a great point. Can yeah, I add something real quick, Jim? Oh, sorry. Sure. Well, just before you ask that question, Arthur, I just I'd like to add to what Jim's saying. Um, if you're in the varsity group, you might have heard about the critiques um, a little bit already. If you're in the novice coach group, um, just to add a little bit of context, right? A, a critique is, um, you know, an argument based on um, assumptions that we might be making in a case. So to kind of answer to Jenny and Alyssa's points. Um, in a debate round, if the affirmative team is just talking about whether or not we should privatize, you know, more water or not, we might be skipping over a fundamental assumption that water is only a resource and only valuable in terms of like, you know, helping us stay hydrated and stay alive in that way and ignoring the cultural significance. And so as the negative team, you can make an argument that the affirmative case ignores the cultural significance of water and by ignoring cultural significance and ignoring um, what is important to various cultures, that is a, a way of kind of maintaining a system of cultural erasure, um, which has maybe even more negative impacts than whether or not we privatize water. Um, so it can be a way to take this in a, a different direction, certainly. Um, all right, Arthur, go ahead. I was just adding to the question in terms of what Jim um, just answered. I think one of the alternatives here could be, I mean, a Supreme Court decision from last year kind of returned part of Oklahoma back to the indigenous nations. Um, so we're actually seeing patterns across the country where the original treaties have been violated many times. The, I guess at some, um, some states in the federal government are trying to really attune for some of those genocide and uh, environmental crimes. So the alternatives to really have those treaty renegotiated and a lot of Native American uh, nations are actually re-looking at those treaties. And I think there's a story decisive with the Supreme Court ruling last year that will actually return a lot of those lands back to our control because some of those land, in those treaties Native American can't um, actually fish on their own land, on their ancestral homeland. So um, the alternative to really have the court system kind of re reassert the original terms of the treaties. And that's one, one key alternative that nations are looking at across the country. Yep, that's interesting. Agreed. 
All right. So, um, and I unfor want uh, I unfortunately, one? yes, uh, we'll take one last question and then we'll have to stop it here. Um, go ahead. One last question here. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm not sure if, for example, I mean, I like the argument that you made for water as a human right, but it's so loaded culturally anyway. Um, I would probably argue for water scarcity, say like Cape Town in South Africa or Las Vegas in Nevada, right? I mean, that's like a compelling argument that they may run out. Um, but all throughout the world, I think that the lacking chemical pollution, which it has known effects, just access to disgusting water, I'm like, you know, more than half of the world has access to water that we would consider disgusting. And people survive perfectly fine. I've survived in two of those countries and I'm still here. So, um, you know, it's disgusting, yeah, it's, but for our standards, for first world standards, for the standards of the millions of people living in there, it's just everyday business. Yeah, I, I think that goes back to an interesting question about have we have we swung the pendulum too far in terms of making water so clean that the cost in order to do so is, is having negative effects and, and maybe that kind of goes back to do you do you relook at that or not, I, I think that's an interesting debate because I think a lot your, your gut instinct is to say we're not doing as much to keep it clean we're just we're and, and the reality is that the standards exist but it could be they're so difficult to me that that we're 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 missing out on a basic standard trying to get too clean in other areas. I, I don't know, but I think, I think it's a really interesting question. And where do you put funds? You know, how, how do you make sure you're driving the right behavior and not having super clean water for some, and then you just can't afford even basic water quality for others, for example, that inequality, um, especially at the community level. I mean, I think you can make an argument that when you leave it to a local community level, that disparity becomes, even even wider versus the the federal government perhaps stepping in and ensuring ways to hit whatever that standard is. I think that's an argument you could make. Um, and and just to touch on the international piece briefly, um, I think that um, with the middle school varsity and the high school junior varsity and high school varsity able to bring in their own research if they want to kind of guide this debate in the direction of. Um, you know, we should be more focused on international aid and, and the problems are larger outside the United States. That's a, a direction that we could, uh, that the debate could be taken by the negative team in response to this case. Um, it's not something we're going to provide evidence for necessarily for the novices um, or even middle school, junior varsity, uh, because we want to keep it focused and um, accessible enough for them to just, you know, access one specific uh, debate. Um, but it's, it's definitely a direction you could go with your debaters, um, to help them learn more about. Um, all right. So, um, I know you probably, I'm sure you, you don't necessarily feel like water, uh, experts yet and hearing all these different things from Jim, uh, hopefully was helpful in gaining an understanding and may, uh, you know, may have left you with even more questions because now you know a heck of a lot more. Um, that's kind of the way I always uh, run into these things. Um, but uh, let's let's take the win because we do know a lot more now. Jim's slides will be available in the Coach Camp um, Google Drive and linked on the Google Classroom as well. Um, and um, let's give a big thanks to Jim for coming and talking with us today. So, thank you, Jim. Thank you, thank you Jim. Great job. Um, and uh, you know, Jim. Jim's a debate guy and uh, likes the work that we do, and always is willing to help. So if you have any sorts of questions that were unanswered from this, put them in the exit ticket or or email us, and we'll we'll try and get you some answers to those questions um, as well. Um, so we're going to take a five minute break at this point, and uh, at twelve eighteen, we will come back and talk about how to introduce this topic to your debaters. <laughs>